The National Bureau of Standards built the first electronic computer in Washington, D.C. in 1950. The Standards Electronic Automatic Computer, which we call SEAC, was the first computer with an internally stored program that was in operation in America, and it provided the major focus for the early development of computer technology and its applications in government, in industry. Today we're going to discuss some of the issues involved in the design of the first computer and also attempt to show people why everything started within the federal government even though there are commercial interests which would have you believe otherwise. Okay, there we go. The SEAC computer presented us with many challenges. The first challenge, which was, of course, magnificently overcome, was to demonstrate that an automatic computer with an internally stored program could, in fact, be built to run, which the SEAC did in April of 1950. The second set of challenges was to show that modifications and improvements could be made to the first digital computer. And we have here an example of one of those challenges which was successfully met. This is a picture of the whole SIAC computer as it appeared in the early 1950s. You see all of the 20 or so chassis with the electronics and the operator's console, and in particular, here is one chassis which was used to check the contents of the memory. This memory parity checker was an experiment which was successfully conducted to show that we could build a computer which would check itself to see if it had made any mistakes. And the chassis which did that is here. This is the memory parity checker, which was built in 1952, two years after the SEAC did its first successful computation. This piece of electronics contained vacuum tubes, germanium diodes, delay lines, and many, many solder connections. Here's one of the vacuum tubes that was used in the SEAC. It's a 6AN5 vacuum tube, and it was the last of the great vacuum tubes to be used in computers before transistors made vacuum tubes obsolete. You'll also see here many of the many tens of thousands of solder connections that were used to interconnect all of the wiring all of which was done manually. And of course, if any one of those solder connections failed, the computer failed entirely. So it was very important to be able to check those connections, sometimes by using the so-called jump test, in which we would jump on the floor of the computer to see whether any loose connections broke and therefore caused the computer to fail during testing rather than during productive computation. Additional components you can see here. Are some of the germanium diodes. Here is a vacuum tube base containing germanium diodes wired into it of which there were 12,000 in the computer, all of which, of course, had the same unfortunate property that if anyone failed, the computer would fail. And finally, these are some of the electrical delay lines. In the SEAC, the memory bus had a frequency of one megahertz. So we, we dealt with microseconds, unlike the nanoseconds that we deal with today. And the 
Delay lines served the purpose of seeing to it that the signals would arrive at the germanium diode logic gates within the correct one hundredth of a microsecond. So this exquisite timing was performed by various length delay lines. On the SIAC computer, we had a device which was a modification of an old office dictating machine, which was used to let the programmers store their programs and their data in such a way that they could remove it from the computer. This wire cartridge is one of the devices that was used to store information external to the computer. It consisted of two reels of steel wire with a thin magnetic plating on the wire and the information stored in binary form in such a way that the programmers could record their programs on the wire, bring it to the computer, and then record the results on the wire from the computer and remove it, where a separate device called the outscriber would be used to convert the information from the wire to a punch paper tape, and then from punch paper tape to a printed form which people could read. Here you see the operator plugging one of those cartridges into the device on the computer which would read the information from the wire cartridge. And that was the ponderous method that we used to put information into the computer and to remove it from the computer. Here's the results of another experiment, less concerned with new hardware than it was with new uses of the computer. One of the very earliest experiments in artificial intelligence was an attempt to show that a computer could learn. And I wrote programs that enabled a person, or for that matter, another computer, to match binary digits in a sort of coin matching experiment. One of the interesting tests that we made was a competition between another engineer and myself in which we each wrote a program to generate binary digits and then compare them. If they were different, I would win. If they were the same, he would win. We promised each other that neither of our programs would look at the other's program to figure out what strategy was being used. Those programs are both recorded on this cartridge. And today, we can no longer read the information on here. And since I kept my promise and he kept his, neither of us knows who won and what the program was that we were using. Because although the information is here, the technology no longer exists for being able to read that information. And so, in a certain sense, it's gone. <laughs>